Make sure I have a look at me. So, that's good. You're still in there. You're still smiling. Right now. Listen to me and don't look at yourself. Okay. Don't look. Yep. Okay. Page 23. Faith and religion. Uh, despite its apparent persuasiveness, the claim that religion is simply a matter of faith is nothing more than a modern myth. It's just not true. Uh, a lot of people say it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it sincerely. You can believe in Santa Claus as sincerely as you want. That does your sincerity doesn't matter. While religion certainly requires faith, religion is not only about faith. Facts are also central to all religions, because all religious worldviews, including atheism, make truth claim. They claim that something or some things are true. And many of those truth claims can be evaluated through scientific and historical investigation. For example, theists, like Christians, Muslims, and Jews, say that the universe had a beginning, while many atheists and pantheists, for example, the New Agers or Hindus, say that it did not. The universe is eternal. These are mutually exclusive claims. Do you understand what that term means? Both cannot be true at the same time. Okay, so if, if Autumn tells me that she is 16 and 18, either we're adding those together and you're 34, right? But you, you can't be both 16 and 18 at the same time. Those are two mutually exclusive things. Okay, that, that might, both, might both be false, right? So, so they might both be false. Wow, you're young. Yeah. Uh, uh, but they can't both be true. Does that make sense? And that's going to play really heavily in the early part of what we said. They can't both be right. Either the universe had a beginning or it did not. By investigating the nature and history of the universe, we can reasonably conclude that one view is right and the other is wrong. We'll get to that point. The alleged resurrection of Christ presents another example. Christians claim that Jesus rose from the dead, rose from the dead while Muslims say that Jesus never even died. Some believe that he was just merely um, badly wounded on the cross, and while he was in the tomb, uh, something happened that helped him revive and he rolled away a stone and walked out. Other Muslims believe that a substitute died on the cross. He looked like Jesus, like a twin or a brother, but it wasn't Jesus. But they, they, they claim that, um, say that Jesus never even died. Like he was alive after he died. So again, one of these views is right and the other is wrong. Actually, they could both be wrong, right? Um, but either he rose from the dead or he did not. And, and one of those Right. How can we know which one is right? By evaluating each of those conflicting truth claims against the historical evidence. Uh, notice that, uh, that not only do different religions attempt to answer these questions, but scientists also have something to say about these matters. That is, science and religion often address the same questions. Where did the universe come from? Where did life come from? Are miracles possible? And so on. In other words, science and religion are not mutually exclusive categories, as some have suggested. Certainly not all religion, religious claims are open to scientific or historic investigation. Some are unverifiable dogma, religious beliefs as well. Nevertheless, the validity of many religious beliefs can be checked out. Uh, some beliefs are reasonable. They can be uh, proven with a high degree of certainty, while others are clearly unreasonable. The problems with Christianity. Is Christianity reasonable? We believe it is. However, unless one makes a thorough investigation of the evidence with an open mind, uh, mind, belief in Christianity may appear to be problematic. First, there are many perceived intellectual objections, like those mentioned above, the problem of evil and the objections of many scientists. Second, there are emotional obstacles that sometimes obstruct the acceptance of Christianity. Christian exclusivism, the doctrine of hell, and the hypocrisy of Christians are emotional roadblocks to just about everyone. In fact, hypocrisy in the church probably repels more people than any other thing. And I believe that's true. Someone once said the biggest problem with Christianity 
these questions. Finally, there are volitional reasons. The word volitional means by choice, of your own volition, so by your own choice. Uh, so uh, finally, there are volitional reasons to reject Christianity, namely Christian morality, which seems to restrict our choices in life. Since most of us don't want to answer to anyone, yielding our freedom to, to an unseen God is not something we naturally want to do. Yet despite these intellectual, emotional, and volitional obstacles, we submit that it's not faith in Christianity that's difficult, but faith in atheism or any other religion. That is, once one looks at the evidence, we think it takes more faith to be a non-Christian than it does to be a Christian. This may seem like a counterintuitive claim, but it's simply rooted in the fact that every religious worldview requires faith, even the worldview that says there is no God. Why? Because as limited human beings, we do not possess the type of knowledge that will provide us with absolute proof of God's existence or non-existence. Outside of the knowledge of our own existence, I know I exist because I have to, I have to exist in order to ponder the question we deal in the realm of probability. Whatever we've concluded about the existence of God, it's always possible that the opposite conclusion is true. In fact, it is possible that our conclusion in this books, our conclusions in this book are wrong. We don't think they are because we have good evidence to support them. Indeed, we think our conclusions are true beyond a reasonable doubt. This type of certainty, say 95% plus certainty, is the best that fallible and finite human beings, fallible means we make mistakes, finite means we're not infinite, uh, human beings can attain for most questions. And it is more than sufficient for the biggest decisions in life. Nevertheless, some faith is required to overcome the possibility that we are wrong. I just remembered something I forgot to do. I will do it. Um, as you can already see, the book uses some words. Um, and so at the very beginning of this, I made a video or an audio tape of me reading uh, the book, uh, the entire book. It's made on my phone from my living room. So you hear my dog bark occasionally. We only had one dog back then. And yeah, I make mistakes and I say I'm a lot and all that. But if it's helpful for you to hear it as you're reading it, it's helpful to everyone. But if it's particularly helpful, um, I, I make that available to everyone. I forgot to make it available to everyone. I've got to figure out again how I make it available to everyone. Um, but um, also, I do what I'm doing right now. I uh, give you definitions to some of your words. That helps you too. Okay, the faith of an atheist. While some faith is required for our conclusions, it's often forgotten that faith is also required to believe any worldview, including atheism and pantheism. We were reminded of this when we met an atheist named Barry at one of our sem seminars. Barry was incredulous that a mutual friend, Steve, had become a Christian. That's my husband's name. Uh, he said, I can't figure Steve out. He claims to be intellectual, but he can't answer all the objections I pose to him about Christianity. He says he doesn't have all the answers because he's new and still learning. I, Frank, said, Barry, it's virtually impossible to know everything about a particular topic. Uh, and it's certainly impossible when that topic is an infinite God. So there has to come a point where you realize you have enough information to come to a conclusion, even if unanswered questions remain. Barry agreed, but still didn't realize that he was doing exactly what he was chiding Steve for doing. <clears throat> Barry had decided his view atheism was correct, even though he did not have an exhaustive information to support it. Did he know for sure there was no God? Had he investigated every argument and evidence for the existence of God? Did he possess exhaustive information on the question of God? Could he answer every objection to atheism? Of course not. Indeed, it would be impossible to do so. Since Barry, like Steve, is dealing in the realm of probability rather than absolute certainty, he has to have a certain amount of faith to believe that God does not exist. Although he claimed to be an agnostic, Carl Sagan made the ultimate statement of faith in atheistic materialism when he claimed that the cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. How did he know that for sure? How could he? He was a limited human being with limited knowledge. Sagan was up all over his 
Satan was operating in a realm of probability, just like Christians are when they say God exists. The question is, who has more evidence for their conclusion? Which conclusion is more, more reasonable? As we'll see when we look at the evidence, the atheist has, has to muster a lot of more faith than the, the Christian. You may be thinking, it's very sweet. Um, you may be thinking the atheist has to muster a lot more faith than Christian, than the Christian. What possibly could Geisler and Turk mean by that? We mean that the less evidence you have for your position, the more faith you need to believe it, and vice versa. Faith covers a gap in knowledge. And it turns out that atheists have bigger gaps in knowledge because they have far less evidence for their beliefs than Christians have for theirs. In other words, the empirical, forensic, the scientific, forensic, uh, that's historical, uh, and philosophical evidence strongly supports conclusions consistent with Christianity and inconsistent with atheism. Here are a few examples of that evidence that we'll unpack in the ensuing chapters, the coming chapters. Number one, scientific evidence overwhelmingly confirms that the universe exploded into being out of nothing. Either someone created something out of nothing, the Christian view, or no one created something out of nothing, the atheistic view, which view is more reasonable? The Christian view, the Christian view, which view requires more faith? The atheistic view. Number two, the simplest, the simplest life form contains the information equivalent of 1,000 encyclopedias. And that's just like a one-celled amoeba. Christians believe only an intelligent being can create a life form containing the equivalent of 1,000 encyclopedias. Atheists believe non-intelligent forces can do it. Christians have evidence to support their conclusion. Since atheists don't have any such evidence, their belief requires a lot more faith. Number three, hundreds of years beforehand, ancient writings foretold the coming of a man who would be, actually be God. This man-God, is it is foretold, would be born in a particular city from a particular bloodline, suffer in a particular way, die at a particular time, and rise from the dead to, uh, to atone for the sins of the world. Immediately after the predicted time, multiple eyewitnesses proclaimed and later recorded uh, that those predicted events had actually occurred. Those eyewitnesses endured persecution and death when they could, uh, when they could have saved themselves by denying the events. Thousands of people in Jerusalem were then converted after seeing or hearing of these events, and this belief swept quickly across the ancient world. Ancient historians and writers allude to or confirm these events, and archaeology corroborates them. Having seen evidence from creation that God exists, Christians believe uh, these multiple lines of evidence show beyond a reasonable doubt that God had a hand in these events. Atheists must have a lot more faith to explain away the predictions, the eyewitness testimony, the willingness of the eyewitnesses to suffer and die, the origin of the Christian church, and the corroborating testimony, the, the agreeing testimony of the other writers, archaeological finds, and other evidence that we'll investigate later. Now, perhaps these three points have raised in your mind some questions and objections. They should, because we're leaving out a lot of the details that we'll unpack throughout the book. The main point for now is that you see that what we mean when we say that every worldview, including atheism, requires some degree of faith. Even skeptics have faith. They have faith in that skepticism is true. Likewise, agnostics have faith that agnosticism is true. There are no neutral positions when it comes to belief. Philip Johnson so aptly put it, one who claims to be a skeptic of one set of beliefs is actually a true believer in another set of beliefs. In other words, atheists, who are naturally skeptical of Christianity, turn out to be true believers in atheism. As we shall see, if they are honest with the evidence, they need a lot more faith to maintain the atheistic beliefs than Christians need to maintain theirs. Discovering the box top. We claim that there is strong evidence supporting Christianity. How will we proceed through this evidence? Since about 1996, we have traveled together around the country conducting a seminar called The Twelve Points of Christianity is True. In it, we per proceed logically from the question of truth all the way to the conclusion that the Bible is the Word of God. This book generally will follow the same logical 12-point progression. 
Truth about reality is knowable. The opposite of truth is false. It is true that a theistic God exists. This is evidenced by the beginning of the universe, the design of the universe, the design of life, and the moral law. If God exists, then miracles are possible. Miracles can be used to confirm a message from God. For example, as acts of God to confirm a word from God. The New Testament is historically reliable. This is evidenced by early testimony, eyewitness testimony, un uninvented, authentic testimony, eyewitnesses who were not deceived. The New Testament says Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus' claim to be God was miraculously confirmed by his fulfillment of many prophecies about himself, his sinless life and miraculous deeds, his pre prediction and accomplishment of his resurrection. Therefore, Jesus is God. Whatever Jesus, who is God, teaches is true. Uh, Jesus taught that the Bible is the word of God. Therefore, it is true that the Bible is the word of God and anything opposed to it is false. Before we begin presenting this line of reasoning, please note five points. First, we are not suggesting that the above points are true by definition. Most of these points are premises that need to be justified by evidence. For example, Point three claims it is true that the, that the theistic God exists. That claim isn't true just because we say so. It needs to be backed up by good evidence, by good reasons. We'll give you those good reasons when we get to that point in the book. Second, notice that we are starting at the point of complete skepticism. That is, we are starting with a person who says he doesn't even believe in truth. We need to start there because if the prevailing view of the culture is right, and this is the then that there is no truth, then it can't be true that a theistic God exists or, there, or that there is a true word from that, that God. However, if there is truth and that truth can be known, then we can go on to investigate the truth of God's existence and other points that follow. Miracles are possible, the New Testament is historically reliable, and so forth. Third, if this line of reasoning is sound, true. And that's a big if that this book will attempt. That is, that's the big if that uh, this book will attempt to show. It necessarily disproves other religions where they differ from the Bible. This sounds incredibly arrogant and presumptuous, but we'll address that later. This would not mean that all other religions are completely false or they have no truth. Nearly all religions have some truth. They're simply saying that if the Bible is true, than any specific claim. Hi. Oh, I suppose. I doubt he's. But you never know. Um, I can't run from this one. <laughs> um, we're saying that if the Bible is true, then any specific claim that contradicts the Bible must be false. For example, if the Bible is true and it says there is a God beyond the universe who created and sustains the universe, that's theism. Then any claim that denies theism, like atheism, must be false. Likewise, if the Bible is true at, at, and it claims that Jesus rose from the dead, then the Quranic from the Quran, the uh, Muslim holy book, denial of that fact must be false. By the way, the reverse is also true. If the evidence showed that the Quran was true, then the Bible would be false, whatever, uh, wherever it contradicted, contradicted the Quran. Fourth, we give evidence for Christianity because we ought to live our lives based on truth. Socrates once said that the unexamined life is not worth living. We believe that the unexamined faith is not worth believing. Furthermore, contrary to popular opinion, Christians are not supposed to just have faith. Christians are commanded to know what they believe and why they believe it. They are commanded to give answers to those who ask and to demolish arguments against the Christian faith. Since God is reasonable, that from Isaiah 1, and wants us to use re our reason, Christians don't get brownie points for being stupid. In fact, using reason is part of the greatest commandment, which according to Jesus is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Finally, we are often asked if Christianity has so much evidence to be then why don't more people believe it? Our answer, although we believe, evident, uh, believe the evidence we're about to present shows that the Bible is true beyond, a reasonable, but beyond reasonable doubt, no amount of evidence can compel anyone to believe it. Belief requires a sense not only of the mind, but also of the will. 
While many non-Christians have honest intellectual questions, we have found that many more seem to have volitional re resistance to Christianity. In other words, it's not that they don't have evidence to believe, it's that they don't want to believe. The great atheist Friedrich Nietzsche ex exemplified this type of person. He wrote, if one were to prove this God of the Christians to us, we should be even less able to believe in him. And it is our preference that it is our preference that decides against Christianity, not arguments. Obviously, Nietzsche's disbelief was based on his will, not on his intellect. At this point, the skeptic might reverse the argument by claiming that it's the Christian who simply wants to believe. True, many Christians believe only because they want to and cannot justify their belief with evidence. They simply have faith that the Bible is true, and merely want, wanting something to be true doesn't make it so. However, what we are saying is that many non-Christians do the same thing. They take a blind leap of faith that their non-Christian beliefs are true simply because they want them to be true. In the ensuing chapters, we'll take a hard look at the evidence to see at the evidence to see who has the, who has to take the bigger leap. The skeptic might ask. But why would anyone want Christianity to be false? Why would anyone not want the free gift of forgiveness? Good question. But we think the answer lies in the volitional factors we touched on earlier. Namely, many believe that accepting the truth of Christianity would require them to change their thinking, friends, priorities, lifestyles, or morals, and they are not quite willing to give up control over their own lives in order to make those changes. They believe that life would be easier and more fun without such changes. Perhaps they uh, realize that while Christianity is all about forgiveness, it's also about denying yourself and carrying your cross. Indeed, Christianity is free, but it can cost you your life. There's a difference between proving a proposition and accepting a proposition. We might be able to prove Christianity is true beyond a reasonable doubt, but only you can choose to accept it. Please consider this question to see if you are open to accept it. If someone could prove, uh, pro excuse me, if someone could provide reasonable answers to the most significant questions and objections you have to Christianity, reasonable to the point that Christianity seems true beyond a reasonable doubt, would you then become a Christian? Think about that for a minute. If your honest answer is no, then your resistance to Christi Christianity is emotional or volitional, not merely intellectual. No amount of evidence will convince you because evidence is not what's in your way. You are. In the end, only you know if you are truly open to the evidence of Christianity. One beauty of God's creation is this. If you're not willing to accept Christianity, then you're free to reject it. This freedom to make choices, even the freedom to reject truth, is what makes us moral creatures and enables each of us to choose our ultimate destiny. This really hits at the heart of why we exist at all and why God might not be as overt in revealing himself to us as we would like. For if the Bible is true, then God has provided each of us with the opportunity to make an eternal choice, either accept him or reject him. And in order to ensure that our choice is truly free, he puts us in an environment that is filled with evidence of his existence, but without his direct presence. A presence so powerful that it could overwhelm our freedom and thus negate our ability to reject him. In other words, God has provided enough evidence in this life to convince anyone willing to believe, yet he has left some amb ambiguity unknowingness, so as to not compel the unborn. In this way, God gives us the opportunity either to love him or to reject him without violating our freedom. In fact, the purpose of this life is to make that choice freely and without coercion. For love, by definition, must be freely given and cannot be coerced. That's why C.S. Lewis wrote the irres irresistible and indisputable this is a quote from C.S. The irresistible and the indisputable are the two weapons which the very nature of God's scheme forbids him to use, merely to override human will as his felt presence in any but the faintest and most mitigated degree would certainly do. 
would be for him useless. He cannot ravish. He cannot overtake you physically. He can only you. We hope the evidence is uh, we present in this book will in some small way glue you to God. Keep in mind that it's not our evidence. It's his. We are simply compiling in a logical order. By using real-world stories and illustrations as often as possible, we intend to make this book readable and its reasoning easily accessible. Our in conclusion. As we have seen, many of the many religious truth claims can be investigated and their plausibility determined. Since all conclusions about such claims are based on probability rather than absolute certainty, they all, including atheistic claims, require some amount of faith. As we look at the evidence for the ensuing chapters, we'll see that, that conclusions such as God exists and the Bible is true are certainly beyond reasonable doubt. Therefore, it takes a lot more faith to be a non-Christian than it does to be a Christian. However, uh, we, have, uh, have, we, have all, we have also acknowledged that evidence alone cannot convince someone to become a Christian. Some atheists and not Christians may reject Christianity not because the evidence is inadequate, but because they don't want to accept it. Some people choose to suppress or push down the truth, the truth rather than live by it. In fact, we humans have a fatal tendency to try to adjust the truth to fit our desires rather than adjusting our desires to fit the truth. Christians do that too, don't they? Uh, but wait. Isn't there an alter a third alternative? What about remaining agnostic, like the Old Testament professor at the beginning of this chapter? He said he didn't know if God exists. Some may think that such a person is open-minded, but perhaps. But there's a big difference between being open-minded and being empty-minded. In light of the evidence, we think agnosticism is a decision to be empty-minded. After all, isn't the reason we should be open-minded so that we can recognize truth when we see it? So that so what we are uh, to do, what are we to do, excuse me, when there's enough evidence to point us to the truth? For example, what should we do when we see evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that George Washington was the first president of the United States? Should we remain open-minded as to the first president, who the first president was? No, that would be empty. Some questions are closed. As we'll see, there's enough evidence regarding Christianity to draw a reasonably certain conclusion. As Mortimer Adler observed, our conclusion about God impacts every area of our lives. It is the key to finding unity and diversity and ultimate meaning in life. It is literally the most important question for every human being to address. Fortunately, if our reasoning is correct, we will discover the box top of to life's puzzle and end and the end of our journey. So let's take the first step on that journey. It begins with the question of faith. So at the beginning of every, I'll say unit, collection of chapters, uh, it, it will tell you, it has that whole logical argument written down that, that you can see in the uh, contents at the beginning of the book. And so chapters one and two are going to are, are going to, to uh, cover the first two points. You'll have a quiz after chapter one. You'll have a test after chapter three uh, on both chapters. So the first chapter will cover truth about reality is noble, and the second will cover uh, the opposite of truth. Uh, so uh, that's where we'll begin. Do you have any questions about what we read yesterday? Um, that's it for today. We're going to do a scuba on Psalm 145, but we'll, we'll figure it out.